in town. Uh, and uh, our last stop, we had the privilege and the honor to lead some young people to the Lord and to in inform them about the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And there were some uh, younger, other young, young folks that rededicated their life to the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So needless to say, we will be in touch with them to make sure that everything goes as planned. Amen. Praise God. Well, I want to revisit a topic that uh, we talked about before, and it has to do with the protection that we have in Christ. Amen. 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 There is no other protection that is available that is as thorough and that is as complete as that, that which we have in Jesus. Amen. Amen. And uh, what I'm going to do, what I'd like for us to do, I'm going to <clears throat> look at Psalm 91. And I'm, I know, know for a fact I won't get to cover all of these verses, but I would like for us at least to, to read it together. And as you do that, I want you to keep in mind that uh, this psalm was written by David, and he is understood as a prophet. The, the, the Bible speaks and indicates that he was a prophet. So he talked about uh, what God will do, of course, as we go through, through this. But I want to inform you that because Jesus has shed his blood already, the things that we're going to re read here, they are actually in effect right now. Yes. Amen? Amen? So we, we may touch on some of those things uh, as we go along. Uh, in other words, after we, we finish reading this, but I want you to keep that in mind. Amen? Amen. All right. Does everyone have Psalm 91? Amen. Praise God. Well, let's read that together. Ready? Read. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Yes. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will deliver him. Or excuse me, I will set him on high because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen? Amen. So as I mentioned, this is in effect right now. So we are right now in Christ for those of us who have made him Lord of our life and have accepted that salvation package that he's made available to us. Amen? Amen. So, so in, in talking about this, there is someone in Scripture by the name of Paul, who knew about danger, 
who knew about peril and all, and all that stuff. So let's start off by looking at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. And Paul is going to help us to understand, understand something. And it reads, This is so also that in the last days perilous time shall come. Now, I don't want us to focus on the peril. I want us to fo focus on the protection. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Because a peril is something that causes or may cause injury, loss, or destruction. But again, because of what Christ has done for us, we are delivered from peril. Amen. We are delivered from destruction. We have got to understand that in our new birth status as born again believers, mm -hmm. we cannot allow the dangers that are mentioned on the news media, mm -hmm. in, in general conversation, yes. to affect us. Because we've got to know that, that we're not like everybody else. Amen. <laughs> Amen. You have to know and understand that. So in, in the midst of your daily conversations, and if you were to think back to those, you may have been uh, faced with things that people have said. Well, you know, uh, somebody got shot at the mall last night or, or this happened and all that. I, I reckon, uh, you know, if I don't watch it, that'll, that'll happen to me. No, you can't agree with that. I said you can't agree with that. that. Because of what the Word of God has promised you as a born-again, spirit-filled believer, that does not apply to you. Now, there, there are going to be times when you might, not, you might be the only one that adamantly disagrees with that. But you don't have to get into an argument about it. You don't have to get into a shout-out match about it. Just say, well, that doesn't apply to me. And if you want to talk about it later, let's wait the break time. You know why I said that wait the break time? Why? Because you're not called on your job to minister the word of God. Amen. Amen. That's what breaks and lunches are for. Amen. <laughs> Just so you do everything decently and in order. Amen? Amen. All right. <laughs> All right. So whenever we uh, look at that, in 2 Corinthians 11, 26. It talks about some of the things that Paul faced. He says in verse 26, <clears throat> In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. But if you want to write this one down, I'll read it. In 2 Timothy 3.11, he says, Persecutions, afflictions which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of some of them. Out of the ones that were too hard for me to handle. No, I said all of them. But he said, out of them all, <clears throat> God delivered him. Now, if you were to look up that word all, it would mean everything. <laughs> there would not be anything left out. So it, I'm, I'm telling you, no matter what happens, you've got to know and understand that, that you are protected by the blood of Jesus. You are kept by him. Amen? Amen? Do you want to be kept? Yes. Well, you are. Praise God. <laughs> All right. So, so then, a lot of times, what happens with people is that <clears throat> they want God, or, or they want the things of God, but they don't really want God. Now, what you got to understand is that the relationship that we have with Christ, it is not a smorgasbord relationship. It is not a buffet line kind of deal. <clears throat> you can't go by one and say, well, I don't really need that. 
or and you just skip over that and, and pick, pick the next thing. No, 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 no. It is all inclusive. Do you understand? It is all inclusive. That means your health, your wealth, prosperity, everything that you can imagine is included in that salvation package. So you don't have a right to say, well, I don't really need that, but I want this. That's not how it works. You got to want the entire thing because the thing about it is there were some people over in Judges that, well, let's look at it. If you were to look at Judges 10, we're going to just read a couple of scriptures here and there just so you get the gist of, of what we're going to be talking about right here. In Judges chapter 10, uh, verse 6 is, is, is first. <clears throat> and then we'll look at verses 11 through 14. So when we say in Psalms 91.1, while you're turning there, I'll read that. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Now once again, because of what Jesus has done for us, we are now in Him. Amen? Amen. We are in Him. And so, by virtue of us being in Him, there's something that we're going to say. And that is in verse 2. He says, I will say of the Lord, He is my, my refuge and my fortress. Now, refuse and fortress, we can talk about that, that for the rest of the day. Because whenever you're talking about a refuge and a fortress, you are talking about a building that is heavily fortified. That it is there so that no, nobody can get in to hurt or harm you. We're talking about walls that are three and four chariot lengths wide. You know, back in the day. And if you were to look at some of the engineering marvels of today, you could probably look at Fort Knox that is, is enclosed in walls of concrete, steel, and all that. Heavily fortified. <clears throat> the protection <clears throat> that we, we have in Christ far outweighs that. <laughs> I got two hallelujahs. <laughs> I said the protection that we have in Christ far supersedes that. So if you were just to think about the fact that whenever you walk around that you are heavily fortified, you are impregnable, you are able to withstand, listen, any attack, any hurt, harm, or danger that would try to come your way. Did you hear what I said? There should have been like at least all amens up in here. I mean, by me saying that. You know what I mean? So because of that, do you think we have a right to fear anything? No. I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to ask the question again and I want you to answer. Do you think that we have a right to fear anything? No. That's the better. Back to judges. Look at this. And the children of Israel did evil again. That means that they were repeat offenders. Yes. In the sight of the Lord and served Balaam and Ashtaroth and the gods of Syria and the gods of Zidon and the gods of Moab and the gods of the children of Ammon and the gods of the Philistines and forsook the Lord and served him not. So by virtue of them serving all of those, they didn't have a chance to serve the Most High God, which was a huge mistake. Amen. <laughs> In verse 11, and, and the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Did not I deliver you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites, from the, the children of Ammon, and from the Philistines, the Sidonians also, and the Amalekites, and the Moanites, did oppress you? And ye cried to me, and I delivered you out of their hand. Yet, in, in, in spite of all, of all that I've done for you, yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Wherefore, I will deliver you no more. L listen to what he told them. Go and cry unto the gods which you 
have chosen. Go and cry unto the gods which you have chosen. Let them, let them <laughs> deliver you in the time of your, your tribulation. And the children of Israel said unto the Lord, We have sinned. Do thou unto us whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. Deliver us only, we pray thee, this day. And they put away the strange gods from among them and served the Lord. And his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. Now, the thing about it is, folks, is that whenever we make Jesus Christ the Lord of our life, then it is our responsibility to make sure that we divest ourselves from the old life. Because I'm telling you this, there is nothing there that you want. Amen. Listen to this. This is going to be humorous, but you'll remember it. It's like you going to the bathroom. Do you take the time to cry and moan and groan over bathroom material? No. Nor should you take the time to moan and groan over the past. Because it was a, it was a birth unto death. But what Christ has given us is a birth unto life. It's a death unto life. So listen, there is nothing about your pedigree. There is nothing about the color of your skin. There is nothing about where you went to school or where you didn't go to school. What matters is that you have become a son of the Most High God. And whenever that works for you and you make that work for you, you are far above anything that the world has to offer. Far above. Far above. But you have to understand that, that you cannot allow yourself to defend anything that is going to deny you of your first or of your born again life. You can't. Because the, the, the thing about that is the, the, the way that that works is that, for example, <clears throat> I'll give you a personal example. Because I can laugh, laugh at me, and you've seen that. <laughs> so there's the proof. So if, let, let's just say, if I aligned myself with the definitions that the world has about me, or the descriptions that the world has about me, a 50 seven person years of age, a, as they say, a black male. Now just, just hold, hold on to your seats for just a minute. I'll, I'll get there. I'm going somewhere with this. Now, those two statistics would make a person that falls into that category, according to them, susceptible to prostate disorder, mm -hmm. to high blood pressure, mm -hmm. to diabetes, mm -hmm. right? That's, what, that's how, how they would describe a per person that way. Now, just say if I aligned myself with that description, do you think that the Word of God and the power of God can work on my behalf? No. No, it can't. No, it can't. Because I would have allowed those thing, things to take the front seat over what the Word of God says about, about me. Because when he says Jesus was wounded for my transgressions, that he was bruised for my iniquities, and the chastisement of my peace was upon him, and with his stripes I'm healed, and because I'm healed I walk in health, right? So what? You, you see where I'm going? So I don't have time to align myself with that. I'm not black. I'm a son of God. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yeah. Yeah. My, my last name is, is Bernie. 
But I'm in Christ. Yes, yes. All right. And everything that Christ stands for, everything that Christ has given me, I receive. And that's who I am. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. So, yes, whenever conversations come up that don't line up with the word of God, I don't even agree with it. I'm nice about it, though. <laughs> I am. Trust me, I am. I'll just say no. 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 And a popular one now at this time of year. Well, you know, cold and flu season is going around. I reckon I'll catch one. I say, well, I won't. And then the thing about it is they'll be talking about that and they want that. They want to apply that to you. No, no, it's not that not a part of me. No. Uh -uh. I said, no, that won't happen to me. Well, who do you think you are, son of God? I agree with what he says about me. And not only that, but then I continue to say what he said about me. Keep that thing watered. Right. Keep it watered. And because it's the thing that you got to realize is that everything that Jesus did for you, he expects for you to live in that. He expects for you to walk in that. He didn't just do it because he didn't have anything better to do. Did you hear me? He did not do it just because he didn't have anything better to do. He did it so that we would be rejoined with our father, God, so that we could conquer this world for the kingdom of God. And what better way to do it than aligning ourselves with the truth of his word? Who cares what your quote unquote family members, first family members thought about? Or, or, or who cares? Did they die for you? No. Was their blood shed for you? No. So why should you care what they say or think? Right. Because once again, whenever you align yourself to that stuff, everything that is on that frequency. You make, your candidate, you make yourself a candidate to receive. And if you don't want that, then you have no business aligning yourself with that. Is that plain? Okay. Now, let's look at Psalm 91, verse 3. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I like this. In fact, I love this. In verse 3, surely he shall deliver thee. In other words, he has already delivered us. Amen. We are already delivered, but I'm just reading it here the way that David says it. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noise and pestilence. In verse 4, he shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings, his wings, excuse me, a little southern twang going on there. Shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Amen. Amen. Now that un under his wings comparison that he mentions there or yeah, under his, under his wings is a similarity to how a, a chicken or a, a mother hen protects her young. I've had, um, or I had rather, first-hand experience about how that works. Because when a mother hen, whenever those chicks hatched, her first priority is to protect them. And I saw on, on a lot of occasions because, you know, seeing those kinds of things, you, you want to be, at, well, for me, I wanted to be actively engaged and involved with all that. So whenever I would go out and and approach the, the chickens, the first thing they would do is they would run to the mother. Now, some chickens have more sense than some believers. <laughs> Amen. Because they know that whenever they run to that mother hen, that they will be protected. So what makes us think that sometimes whenever things a little cray cray that we have to run away from God. That's the time that you need to be running towards him because didn't we read? I will say of the Lord. He is my refuge. Yes. <laughs> and my fortress. In other words, you're going not only are you going to say you're going to act like he is. Right. 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 Yes. 
you're going to behave like he is. Yes. <laughs> so whenever that happened, whenever they ran to their mother, she would open up her wings and they would get under her wings. She would just sit there. They, they would make a sound. Because they knew they were protected. They knew that they were kept. So you see what I mean when, when I say that some chickens, that, that chickens have more sense than some believers. It's humorous, but check it out. So then Jesus picked up with that in Matthew 23, 37. He said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. In other words, you refused. Amen? Amen. Now, <clears throat> when he talks about, about, in verse 3 again, Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. And from the noise and pestilence. This kind of goes back to something that I was mentioning a little earlier. As in people identifying with their first life. Which really wasn't a life <laughs> at all. <laughs> but they give more allegiance to that. Thinking that that's going to secure a spot for them in whatever world that they are trying to establish. But what we, again, have to understand is that it mentions to us in 1 John 2, 15 and 16 that, listen, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is, but is of the world. So once again, we've got to make sure <clears throat> that we stay allegiant to God and to the, to the kingdom of God so that we do the things that he has created us to do. Because nobody can do what you do in the kingdom of God because you are just that special to God. Amen. You are just that loved by God. So you've got to understand what your place is. And, and you, you can only do that by communing with him. <clears throat> and, get, <clears throat> and getting involved with what he's doing. Not your own, your own thing. But his thing. Amen. Amen? Amen. Because that's the only thing that's going to stand. And speaking of standing... It's my time to stand down. Amen. Because my time is up. <laughs> That's great, yes? Amen. I'm going to first find out if Pastor has anything he wants to interject before the next one. He's just going to wait. He's got an eject button on the back. Once he springs up, you know he's up and it's over. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, that's good, good word. Amen? Amen. Okay. So we're, we're gearing up for passing off the baton to Elder Ron Neal. Amen? All right. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Am I on this time? Yeah. Okay. All right. So how's everyone doing this morning? Good, 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 good. I'm going to pick up from last week. If that, that's okay with you. Amen. All right. I'm going to start with a little example, a little, little story. Um, for those of you who know, know some of mine and Sister Granada's likes. You know, about once a year or more, <coughs> we will head to, to the racetrack. 
and we will get out there and we'll, we'll actually run our cars, okay? Now, it's an organized event, okay? And this track that we usually go to, it's real technical, you know, so it's got a lot of elevation changes and hook turns and switch backs and all that, that kind of stuff. So prior to, you know, it's usually a group of us and there's a driver's meeting and you sit and there's a, a main person, a main facilitator that gets up there and goes through the course, the rules, make sure everybody can identify the flags because that's how they, how they communicate with drivers on the course. You know, so if you're doing something bad, it's a black flag, they roll it up and they point it at you, you know, things like that. Okay. <clears throat> they also talk about the course and they'll talk about the, the best way to run the course. Okay, they call it a line. Okay, they say, okay, this is the best line to run. Now, not, not only do they talk about that, uh, and they give certain instructions and, and whatnot, but then afterwards, we all head out and we do a low speed run of the whole thing with the facilitator out front. And they show you, because first they've talked to you about it, okay? And then they show you the best line to run. And we do this about four or five, six times. You know, and, and it's a, it's a three to four mile course. You know, so we, you know, low speed, just to make sure everyone can master it. You know, we know the exact line to run, okay? There are instructions, right? right? That, they're, that, that they're giving to us. They also give us some warnings. They say, okay, so you could run, run this a different way, but if you do, you're gonna slide off into the grass out of control. And there have, been, there have been those who have. There have been those who not only slid off into the grass out of control, but they flipped their vehicle. And it just flipped and they totaled it. Okay. okay. So not following the correct path could result in injury and a lot of expense. Okay. But if you follow the correct line, you can have a safe run, you can have a really fast run because the correct line helps you to get through the course the quickest. So for those who are going for time, you run your fastest times that way. Okay. All this is based upon following the instructions. Do you get where I'm going with this? Amen. Okay. So last week we were, talk we were talking about should we pray for sickness? Right? Now according to what the scripture says, we're not supposed to pray for sickness. That's not what Jesus said. He said to lay hands on the sick and they would recover. Right? Let's take a look at, let's see where, where this is here. There's a passage in Luke chapter 17. Let's take a look at that. And this is just an example that Jesus gave. We'll start at verse 11. Let's see here. Oh, you know what? It would help if I was in the right book. You guys are in Luke and I'm in John. <laughs> okay, verse 11. And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Let me pray for you. Is that what he said? He said, Let me pray for you. Let's intercede. That you can get your healing. No, that's not what it Actually, it says that he told them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. Mm -hmm. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. Amen. Now, in this case, there were, there were situations where he laid his hands on a leper. In this case, he gave him a command. Okay? He gave him a command. So when it comes to this whole following of instructions, we all like results, right? Amen. We're about to enter a new year. How many this past year, 2018, got all the results that you wanted? 
There's no hands up. up. <laughs> did, you, did you know that Jesus guarantees results? Yes. If we're not getting the results that he guaranteed, then we need to take a look at our process. Amen. Are we trying to do things our way? Or are we doing things his way? There would be more people completely healthy if we followed his formula. When he said to lay hands on the sick, if doing things our way got the results that he promised, then there'd be a whole lot more well people then, wouldn't there? Hmm? We can apply this not just to folks who are dealing with some kind of illness. We can apply this to more than just that. This has to do with really anything in life. Now, think about this. A lot of times, you know, when Jesus says you know, that we can say unto this mountain, be thou removed. So he basically he says we can have what we say, right? But how much do we really believe that, though, when it comes to the things of Christ? Now, we believe it when it comes to things that are not of Christ. Right? I mean, stuff flies out of our mouths all the time, right? Yeah, based upon how we feel about a situation. And what happens? Exactly what we said. You get what you say. But then, if the situation looks a certain way, and the scripture says one thing, uh, I don't know if that's going to work. Because the situation looks like this. Whenever we try to do things a way other than how Christ has told us to do things, did you know that that is akin to the same spirit that Lucifer was of in heaven? Did you know that? When we decide, well, I don't think that, I don't think that this way that Christ laid out, I, I think we need to do it like this. That is akin to the same spirit that was at work in Lucifer when he rebelled against God. I mean, just really think about it. God set out a method. We say, no, no, but I like this method. Or this is what I think is going to work because this is how things look. He says, no, I need you to do it like this. But we say we want to do it like, like this. We say we want results, Right? He didn't tell us to look at how the thing looked. He just said to do things a certain way. Right? It's getting quiet. <laughs> Let's take a look at an example. Let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 15. We're going to start at verse 1. And we're going to do a little bit of reading here. <clears throat> Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which the Amalekites did to Israel. How he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek, and utterly destroy all that they have, and spare them not, but slay both men and women, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. In other words, wipe everything out. Okay? And Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Tel Telhaim, 200,000 footmen and 2,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. And Saul said unto the Kenites, Go depart, get thee down from among the Am Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. Now, I'll just kind of sum up a little bit of, of, of where this is going. 
There's, Saul is supposed to wipe out everything, right? So, they go into battle. We go down to verse 9. It says, But Saul and the people spared Agag, and the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of the fatlings, and the lambs, and all that was good, but not utterly destroyed them. But everything that was vile and refuse, that they destroyed utterly. Now, you know what I found interesting as I read through this passage? When Samuel came, asking about all this, Saul said, I obey the word of the Lord. The man lied. He didn't obey the word, he didn't obey the word of the Lord. If God says do things this way and we tweak his plan a little bit, have we done things his way? No. No, we didn't do things his way. It has to be exactly as he said. Exactly. Okay, so going back real quick to should we pray for sickness? You see it all the time on TV, you know, in different churches, just all over the place. You're praying for sickness. Why are we praying for sickness when God told us to, to handle things a different way? Lay hands on the sick. You can speak to it. Why are we deciding we're going to do it a different way? This is an example of what Saul did when he was given certain instructions. He handled things his own way. You know, you know what it resulted in? He lost everything. Samuel had to let him know, God has rejected you from being king. He would have extended your kingdom, but no more. He's moved to somebody else. If we want results, we have to do things God's way. It's real quiet. <laughs> We talk about faith, yes? How faith works. We have the faith of God, right? Okay, well, why say that we have the faith of God, but then still decide, okay, but I'm going to sit that aside and do things like this. And then wonder why it doesn't work. Yeah, it reminds me of, um, there's a, a minister, he's, he's since passed. Uh, he was having a service, and there was a man who had, I think it was tuberculosis of the spine. Okay? And he called him up, because he said he needed, he needed to be restored. So, the minister laid hands on him, and said, okay, now see if you can bend over and touch your toes. And he couldn't. Because that's not what God told him to say. And he laid his hands on him again. Said, see if you can bend over and touch your toes. And he couldn't. Because that's not what God told him to say. This happened three times and he sent the man back to his seat. And this minister indicated that he, he caught a glimpse of someone standing by the podium. And he looked over there and he said he saw the image of Jesus standing there. And he said, it didn't work. And he told him, I told you it would work. He said, but it didn't work. He said, his eyes lit up like a flame of fire. And said, I told you it would work. And then he disappeared. So he called the men back up. He laid hands on him. He said, bend over and touch your toes. And he bent over and touched his toes. There's no if with God. There's no if. What, what, what if? Well, see, if. There's no if. When he says something is going to work and it's effective, do it in his way and it'll work the way he said it would. Amen. Amen. As we approach this year, he called us to also set an example. Okay? Now, I've, I've spoken to pastors from various denominations. See, we can't be leaning to tradition and statistics and education and all this other kind of stuff. Well, this is what it said. I don't care what it said. I don't care what it said. I don't care what tradition says. I don't care. God doesn't care. What he cares about is what he said and what he said to do. I suppose look at pastors who have said, oh, well, you know, we can't really take the word of God exactly as it is. You know, we have to, you know, mix in some of our, our tradition. And, and I say, no, we should take the word of God exactly as it is and exactly as he says it is. That's how you get your results. So, 
Don't mix in your tradition or talk about, okay, well, you know, research says. I don't care what research says. What's the Word of God say? What does the Word of God say? You can lay hands on yourself and you will recover. You can lay hands on yourself. You can speak the Word to yourself and you will recover. You'll be restored. Because Christ already redeemed us from all of this. We don't need to be asking Him for anything. He's already given it to us. We just need to take hold of it. We have to take hold of it. Is this making sense? Yes. <laughs> so as we set this example, whenever, whenever we decide that we're going to do things our way and we don't get the results, it's a poor reflection on the kingdom of God. Yes, it is. And God will not be embarrassed. That's right. He will not be embarrassed. So we need to take his word and apply it as it is. We can't water it down and say, you know, that we shouldn't be shacking up. But you know, this is the 21st century. Does, does our place and time dictate whether God's word is true or not? No, no, no. Just because a whole bunch of people get together and decide, well, we think this is the right thing to do, does that make it right? No. No, it doesn't make it right. We take a look at the standard of scripture and we say, okay, we must align with this. It's not a matter of saying that we believe it, but then not actually believing it. We have to walk in it. See, we can't have more trust and confidence in the natural things that we see than we do in what God says. Where do you think the natural stuff came from? Where do you think the natural stuff came from? That which we can see came out of the unseen. Which is why he says, look not at the things that are seen. But the things that are not seen. Because the things that are not seen, they're more real than the things that you see. It's not a matter of just speaking. The scripture says... I believe, therefore have I spoken. People speak things all the time. They, they say, okay, well, well, I guess this is what the Word of God says, so let me just say it, and hopefully it's going to happen. And then you look foolish in front of everybody. This has to be so much of a part and a parcel of your being. See, see, we minister the Word up here all the time. Pastor brings forth incredible word all the time. Yes, he does. But what do we do with it when we leave? We're going to leave out of here and, okay, okay, well, I'm out of church now. Back to the same old thing. No wonder you're not getting the results that you want. That's what happens. Okay, so the example that we started with. We leave out of the driver's meeting. We jump on the track and decide, well, I'm going to do two things my way. You may not make it home that night. It's also a matter of, we talk about trusting God's word. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. Right? Okay, okay so when you can't quite see what you think needs to be there, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Because remember, he's, he's given us the spirit of truth who guides us. So when he says, go, go forward, full throttle, but I can't see what... Go forward, full throttle. Go. But I can't... Go. The scripture talks about, now the just shall live by faith. But it says, anyone who draws back. I, uh, I don't want to says his soul has no pleasure in him. Because he expects for us to trust the leading of the Holy Spirit within us that always agrees with his word. Always. So, back to this example, which hopefully will kind of drive it home for you. There's this back stretch on this track. Okay? It's a long back stretch. In some cases, you can top out your car back there. But you get to a part of the track where you can't see what's on the other side. You 
can't see it because you're coming up and it literally drops down like this and you can't see it. But there's a man in the flag booth. And when you come around the corner, you can see that man. Now, if there's an issue, you'll be out there waving. Okay? And then you know, okay, I need to slow down, take, take precautions. But if that flag's not waving, pedal to the floor. You fly over that crest with the pedal all the way in. But you know, it's interesting because you can't see it, but you got to trust this guy. Right, right. Right? right. I, I spoke to a driver who, who, who was out there who runs that track all the time, and he said, you know what? Every time I get to that little spot there, I back off the throttle, and I'm, I'm breaking. And he said, I come over, and I find myself having to throttle down again, but then you can't get up to the speed that you were, you were going before. Right. But if you trust the man in the booth, <laughs> throttle down. Because unless he says otherwise, you blast it all the way through. You may not always be able to, with your natural eyes, see. But the Spirit of God is in you, who says, trust in me with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. Don't look at the things that are seen. The things that are seen in a situation like that, that is, I can't tell what's over there. He says, it doesn't matter. Throttle down and go. Trust me. And then you get the results you're looking for. Because on that track, then you get a fast time. In life, you get the results God promised you because you followed His instructions the way He gave it. Yes? yes. yes? yes. yes. So when He says to trust in Him with all your heart, He didn't say to trust in you with your mind. No. He didn't say to give mental assent to it. He said to trust in Him with all of your heart, not a piece of it. Not, not ah. Okay, look, we're the just, right? We live by faith? By faith. Yes. Do we? Yes. Do we? Yes. <laughs> and ask yourself. Because you know situations come up in life that look a certain way. Right? We live in this world. It looks a certain way. But is that what's real? You know, talk, you know, you hear people talk about, well, you know, reality. No, my reality is God's reality. What is your reality? What is your reality? Because his reality is not everybody else's reality. Which is why they go changing stuff. You know, that's one of the reasons why they're denominations. Their reality is not God's reality. So, oh, well, we need to change this. You know, we have our own doctrine. Did you know that denominational doctrine is doctrines of devils? A lot of people might disagree with me. They're like, but it's a church! Whose church? Are they calling it their church or is it God's church? If it's their church, they come up with their own doctrine and their own traditions and, and they sit and they reason. Well, this couldn't be so. They reason themselves away from the truth. Because it's their church. But when it's God's church, we orchestrate our life by the truth. There's no reasoning away from, oh, well, you know, you know the other days and times in which we live, you know, you got to you got to bend a little. Bend a little. No bending. No bending. An example I give a lot of times, and then I'll stop. An example I give a lot of times when you have folks who come in, they, they come with all kinds of nonsense. And I'll say, you know, the building that we're sitting in, I'll say, you know, the truth could be kind of like this building. Okay? A person can either choose to embrace it and enjoy all of the 
the, the attributes. They can come inside, they can sit down. You know, if it's cold outside, they're warm. If it's hot outside, they're cool. You know, and everything's copacetic. Or they can decide they don't like this building they're gonna, and they're going to kick it down. And they stand outside and they kick and they punch and they fight against the building. Now, the truth doesn't fight with anyone. It just stands for what it is. So that, so that person out there will hurt themselves. And they'll try to say, the building hurt me. Or the truth, you know, they say the truth hurts. The truth doesn't hurt. People say it all the time. There are all these little slogans out there that are complete lies. The truth doesn't hurt. The truth stands supreme for what it is. Because God is truth. And God doesn't hurt anyone. He is absolute truth. He hurts no one. But he will stand and not change. You can try to fight against God and hurt yourself. He didn't hurt you. You hurt, you hurt yourself. Now, when you align with that truth and you say, okay, I'm, God, I'm going to do things your way. Okay, well, then you find out that life is wonderful. You find that it's absolutely wonderful. So, let's just decide what we're going to do. This year, moving forward, are we going to lean to tradition and vestedness in the past? Because, you know, all vestedness is not bad. It's a matter of what you're vested in. If you're vested in the past, as Elder Bernie would say, the axle fell off in his dragon. Okay? You're in a, you're in a heap of trouble. But if you're vested in the absolute truth of God's word, and you've decided, my life is his life. Because he gave this life to me. So I align myself with him. I'm not going to fight against the truth. You can become one with the truth. Because God is truth and he has made us one with him. Now if we try to separate ourselves from him, life becomes horrible. So decide what you're going to do. Are you going to compromise? And say, ah, oh, well, you know, well, because everyone else says, I don't really care what everybody else says. And God doesn't either. He cares what he says. Amen. Amen. Let me stop. <clears throat> okay, so I'm the last leg. Bring it in for a win. Yes. That all right with you? Yes. Okay, okay, before I get started, if there are any that came in after we started our messages and you, you didn't get an opportunity to uh, present your tithes and your offerings, Please feel free to place those in that box over there to my left. Did everyone see it? That steel box on the wall? Make sure you drop it in there before you leave. All right. And just a reminder about the first fruit also for 2019. Amen. Okay. So I'm going to sort of kind of pick up from where I left off last week. Um, however, at 2 a.m. this morning... The Holy Spirit took one page of my plan and crumpled it up and threw it and said, now that's what you need to talk about. However, um, the, I am going to revisit a scripture. He did say I needed to do this back in Deuteronomy. And if I can have um, Elder Bernie or uh, one of the elders get that mic because I need when we read this to make sure that it gets on the recording. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 12. Deuteronomy chapter 12. We talk, talked about this the last time. Would we all agree, even based on the teachings that have gone before already today, that God wants us to profit? Are you convinced that he wants us to profit? Okay, so we're convinced that he wants us to walk in health. We're convinced that he wants us to walk in prosperity. We're convinced that he wants us to walk in protection and safety. Right? He wants it for more for us, actually, I think, than we want it for us. All right? Um, however, that means then that we have to do it his way to get his results, right? Okay, so like with the protection, the president, he has a protection detail, right? It's not as exhaustive as God's protection detail, but just for example's sake. 
he has a protection detail, right? But how can, how is it that he is able to stay protected under his protection detail? How is it? It's actually quite simple. Yes. He has to go where they tell him to go. Which means that there are parameters that, yes, are set for the president. Okay? And if he goes outside those parameters, they can't exactly guarantee his protection now, can they? Okay? So there's a thing called God's grid. And when you stay on God's grid, if you're not on it, get on it. And then stay on it. Okay? When you stay on that grid, then all the stuff that Elder Bernie talked about applies to you. And all the stuff that Elder Ron talked about applies to you. Yeah. If you're not on God's grid, don't worry about it. Deuteronomy 12. I need for us all to read this together. I will stop you as I am prompted. But I need for you to start reading all of us together. And if we can get it on the mic as well, Elder. Starting from verse 1. Ready? Read. These are the statutes and judgments which ye shall observe to do in the land which the Lord God of thy fathers giveth thee to possess it all the days that ye live upon the earth. Ye shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which ye shall possess serve their gods upon the high mountains and upon the hills and under every green tree. And ye shall overthrow their altars, and then break their pillars, and burn their groves with fire. And ye shall hew down the graven images of their gods, and destroy the names of them out of that place. Ye shall not do so unto the Lord your God. Okay, now stop for just a second. Now this sounds much like the ultimatum that that Elder Ron just referred to with Samuel and Saul, right? He gave him an ultimatum. Annihilate. Wipe it all out, okay? And that's because with God, he starts, it's, it's new. He's not going to use anything of the adversary, all right? He wants you to wipe it all out, clean slate. We are starting from scratch new. All right. Verse 5. Read. But unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name there, even unto his habitation shall ye seek. And thither thou shalt come. Okay, now stop. Now he said that the place that we shall seek and the place where he wants for them to come, it's what place? But unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose. In five. Okay. Six. Read. And thither ye shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices and your tithes and heave offerings of your hand and your vows and your free will offerings and the firstlings of your herds and of your flocks. And there ye shall eat before the Lord your God. And ye shall rejoice in all that ye put your hand unto, ye and your households, wherein the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. Okay, now stop for just a second. This same place that he has chosen, he wants us to bring what? Burn offerings, sacrifices, tithes, offerings, vows, Free will offerings, firstlings of the herd of you're not going to do your own thing. He gave specific instructions. You're not going to do your own thing. Verse 9, read. For you are not as yet come to the rest and to the inheritance which the Lord your God giveth you. But when ye go over Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God giveth you to inherit, and when he giveth you 
rest from all your enemies round about, so that you dwell in safety. That, stop just a second. Does that not go right back to the Elder Bernie's message? Okay, he said, but they dwell in safety, but it's only at the place which your God shall choose. All right. Yeah. Okay. Eleven. Read. Then shall then there shall be a place which the Lord your God shall choose to cause His name to dwell there. Thither shall ye bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and the heap offering of your hand, and all your choice vows which ye vow unto the Lord. And ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God, ye and your sons and your daughters and your men and servants. servants. And the Levite that is within your gates, for as much as he hath no part nor inheritance with you, take heed to thyself that thou offer not thy burnt offerings in every place that thou seest. But in the place which the Lord shall choose in one of thy tribes, there thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings, and there thou shalt do all that I command. And we can stop up there. And then down in 18, he also says, But thou must eat them before the Lord thy God in the place which the Lord thy God shall choose thou and thy son and thy daughter, and thy manservant, and thy maidservant, and the Levite that is within thy gates, and thou shalt rejoice before the Lord thy God in all that thou puttest thine hands unto. You don't just flourish anywhere. That's what we said. You, you don't just flourish anywhere. God chooses your pastor for you. All right? We talked about Abraham and Lot. And, and Abraham going where God had called him to go. At some point, it required that there was a separation. And it looked like, like what Abraham chose when it was down to Abraham and Lot, you know, deciding that one, in this case, Abraham let Lot choose where he wanted to go. And then and Abraham said, okay, you go left, I go right. You go right, I go left. All right, right. Lot chose what he thought was prosperous and where he wanted to be. All right, it was his choice. Abraham chose where God wanted for him to be. Okay, he ended up prospering. All right, you, you don't choose your pastor. God cho chooses your pastor. And when he chooses your pastor, he chooses your church. And that's because you don't j just flourish anywhere. All right. Just because you plant something does not necessarily mean that it will grow or that it will grow the way you might want or the way God might want. All right. There's such a thing as the good soil. And that good soil is your church. We had said, naturally speaking, that, for example, when an apple seed is planted, you want to get an apple tree. Where are the nutrients? In the soil. Okay, so if you're not careful to allow God to choose for you, then you could be planting yourself in an area where you're not going to grow and you're not going to flourish. Now, it may look like you're growing. It may look that way. But there's such, such a thing as an apple and then a crab apple, right? They both grow. But only one of them you want to eat. Okay? Only one of them is going to give you a harvest from which you can actually benefit. And that's the genuine apple tree, not a crab apple, apple tree. So you have to decide in 2019, do I want to be a genuine organic apple? Or do I want to be a crab apple? All right? Meaning that are, are you going to be obedient 
actually go where God sends you and where he wants to plant you because you cannot flourish anywhere. All right. Now, this is where the Holy Spirit took a turn. And that is, everybody pull out your phone for, for just a second and look up the word resolution because that word is coming up. It, you know, it comes up every year this time, right? Where people are making a New Year's resolution, right? Yes. And I want somebody to tell me on their phone what descriptions you get when you put in the word resolution. Tell me what you come up with. What was that? Can we get a mic? We got to have some folks paying attention here, please. I have one. Yes. Okay. One is a firm decision to do or not to do something. Okay. All right. Who in here has ever made a, a resolution or a New Year's resolution? Anyone? Okay, we have some. We know people who do it, right? Or even if you don't actually say it, in your mind you say, you think to yourself, well, you'd like to do better with this. You'd like to improve with this, etc. All right? Okay. Now, where he needs for us to focus this year is the tithing our finances and our time. Pull out your pen and pull out your pad. How many hours are in a day? Wrong. <laughs> there are how many day? How many hours in a day? Twelve. Bible will tell you that. Twelve hours in a day, right? Okay. And how many days are there in a week? Okay. Do the math. Do 12 times 7. And tell me what you come up with. Okay. okay. And then what is 10% of that? Eight point four in a week. Now, whether or not you believe in tithing and offering isn't even, even the issue. And that's because it's a law that stands. God has established it. It works whether you tap into it or not. And it has, has benefits. As a matter of fact, walking in God's protection, that's connected to, to whether you tithe just in case you didn't know. Because when one is not walking in God's protection, there is no gray line when it comes to our relationship with Christ. Okay? Some people want to think that it's okay to sit on the fence. Well, you know, after a while, the fence, it kind of... It's not designed for you to sit on. You're either going to be on one side or on the other. All right? So it's either you tithe or you don't. And if you tithe, then you have access to the protection plan and to the health plan. And if you don't tithe, then don't worry about it. Because you don't. All right. Now, that, that's, the, that's the same thing when it comes to our money and our time. Just so that you know I'm not going off the deep end, 2 Corinthians 8, 5. Turn to it. And when... Elder, if you can just go ahead and read that. You find, find it in 2 Corinthians 8, 5. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by, by the will of God. So that they first gave themselves to the Lord, and then they gave themselves to their little church. So there's no such thing as, 
I can give myself to God and I don't have to be involved in my local church. There's no such thing. Spiritual growth is because you allow God to plant you and then you take that same gift that he gave you and you invest that back into your local church. If you're not doing that, you're not going to grow. Which, which means there's no such thing as a secret service Christian <laughs> or an incognito believer. They come maybe Easter and the rest of the time you don't see them. Or an undercover Christian. There's no such thing, okay? You connect it to your local body, your growth comes by your investing yourself in that local body. That's why God plants you there, all right? That's why there's such a thing as giving first myself to God and then giving myself to the local church, which means that I have to embrace tithing my time as well as tithing my finances. So based on the math that we just did, all of us should be investing at least eight hours in this local ministry a week. Some of us barely, barely do an hour. And tithing is first an act of obedience, just like what our elders talked about before me obedience all right so when we tithe we have access to the benefit package for health we have access to the benefit package for protection we have access to the benefit package when it comes to our finances because we're tithing those finances and we're tithing our time minimum eight hours a week and the funny thing is when we all commit to membership here in the ministry what's one of the things that we commit to do to volunteer a minimum of five hours of our time a month. A month. We're not even cashing in on that yet. So then we wonder then how come the benefits that God has for us is not coming to us. Well, that's because you're not vested in the ministry. You're not vested in this local body. Everybody like my vest? <laughs> so my pastor said, you gonna wear that, that up there? I said, yes, it's a long vest. He's like, okay. You're not vested in the ministry. <laughs> You divest that time of those old places, old people, old practices, old behavior, and, and reinvest it in the ministry. And that's because for any of us who are born again believers, when we receive that gift of the Holy Spirit, he gives us first the gift, gift of helps. Hence five hours a month. <laughs> What, what, but what should really be at least eight hours a week, okay? And that translates to more than enough hours throughout the course of the month for us to be able to do what we need to do as a ministry and to grow this ministry. So if you're really vested in this ministry and you really want to do what God has called you to do and you want to walk in his benefit package, eight hours a week, that ought to be your goal, tithing your time in addition to tithing your finances. That's how we grow this ministry. That's how we also duplicate ourselves. All right, can you imagine filling up this place and everyone committing to tithe their finances and their time? Can you imagine what we could do as a ministry instead of wasting that time on old places, old people, old practices, old habits, old behavior. So is that something that we can commit to do in 2019? Because that's where it starts. It's an act of obedience on our part. Remember, God chooses your church for you. And then once he plants you, he expects now for you to sow back into that ministry the same gift that he gave to you. He is an ROI God, return on investment. He is a businessman. 
He didn't put us here just to kick up our heels and act like the world and to live by the world's agenda. We are sent here with specific assignment. Yes, Lord. Yes. Okay, but we're too busy vacationing and spending time with the gals and the guys and doing all the things that we really shouldn't be doing because that's not, not what we're sent here to do. I'm not saying that we don't enjoy life because we do. But we enjoy it on his terms. And we enjoy it his way. All right? So, when it comes to our spiritual gift, remember that it's only given by the Holy Spirit to benefit the human spirit and the body of Christ. Spiritual gifts can only be used by the Holy Spirit. So, we had said that for every person who receives Jesus as Lord and Savior, the initial gift that they have is helps, which means everyone here in the ministry has a capacity to help out in this ministry somehow, some way. And we're going to cash in on it on 2019. So, please, when leadership approaches you, it's not for their benefit. It's for yours. And that's because, what does Ephesians 4 say? When it talks about the fivefold gifts. Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 verse 11. He says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some, some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for what? what? The perfecting of the saints. For what? The work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ, which means he expects for the body of Christ to be built up. All right. right? So when he talks about for the work of the ministry, that's the same as what we read in Deuteronomy chapter 12, where he talked about anything that they would set their hand unto, that's work. All right? But see, this is how the flow goes. When you set your hand to the work of the ministry, and you, you cause the ministry to be edified and to profit, then what you do at home, on your job, etc., it will also profit. Yes, 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 yes. This is the way I like to put it. What I cause to happen to God's house will happen to mine. That's the way it goes. Not the other way around. All right? So when God calls us all together and has these meetings of ambassadors like this, where we get our marching orders and our instructions, that's for the benefit of this ministry, and then for us to take that out beyond the walls so that other people now can benefit and be drawn to the kingdom of Christ. It should not be that we're comfortable enough coming in here and sitting on our laurels, listening to the message, and then leaving and then doing nothing with it. It should not be enough to come and to sit, but we're not engaged and we're not participating and allowing God to receive a return on his investment in us. Some of us have a lot to answer for because we've been eating, eating, eating and getting spiritually fat and, and not putting anything back in ministry. And you bring in your kid to rehearsal and watching him or her rehearse does not count. You as a parent need to be engaged doing something in the work of ministry. So if you want to set or make a resolution and actually be resolute about it, let it be that. Amen? Amen. Pastor? Thank you, you, elders. My cup overfloweth. <laughs> As I was listening to all this wonderful 
word, this rich word, I'm just thinking, how beloved you are of God. To be able to give you all this stuff. And you do not understand that to whom much is given, much is required. So you are happy that you receive it. You kick your heels up, you go home and you say we had a good service. And you do not do anything for the kingdom's sake. When Christ has done so much for us. And I think he's going to require a strict audit from you about this. But just do a little reflection. Uh, everything that was said is so great, it's so wonderful. And I was up this morning at around three o'clock, maybe before three, and I spent some time in my office and the Holy Spirit was just downloading. I don't even know what downloading is from the Holy Spirit. I don't think you really know. It's just maybe your download is different from mine. I understand that. But I was just writing a bunch of stuff out. And I do that so I don't forget anything. It's, it's not all writing that fill up five or ten pages. Just notes that I can remember. And uh, we have talked about this before. And all that you've heard this morning, it's so real. But I don't think most of us understand it. Because you see, the scripture says he will only give wisdom and understanding to those who are wise. Which means, if you're not wise in the ways of God, or want to be wise in moving in the understanding of God, it will not happen. By that I mean is, all of us think that our experiences are our realities. Somebody else's experience we want to hear because it's their reality and sometimes if it's fantastic or magnificent enough we want to make it ours. And God is saying that that's a bunch of hogwash. He's saying only one reality is valid. That is my truth. We talk about healing, deliverance, and all these wonderful things. And, uh, you know, we have been saying this, and it was rehearsed this morning again from Elder Neal. He says, God never said pray about anything. And I was reading this morning, and the Holy Spirit walked me up. He says, like in Luke, he says, um, Jesus prayed all night. And I was wondering, what did he pray about? Because it's not listed. What he prayed. And the Holy Spirit says, he was, was praying that as he was approaching the point of being a mediator, to mediate man from unrighteousness or from sin, into being an intercessor of righteousness, that they would understand his words and take his preordained, predetermined word and make it theirs. Now, now if you notice in, in chapter, th in verse 3 of Genesis 1, the only thing that was so glaring there, because it talks, talks about light, he says, and God says, let there be light. Now, God would, would not have said that if someone did not come after that and says something else that created darkness. <laughs> and most people are taking what has been said after God has spoken and also say what, what they want to say based upon their circumstances or their reality and try to fit it in, into God's word and make it sound like God is saying it. And God is not involved with that. Now, I'm not going to be teaching at all. I just want to mention certain things to you. 
In Romans 8, for instance, Romans 8, just turn to just for a second. Don't get nervous. I know we've been up here now for hour and a half. I know that. But just think, you've had all week off last week. <laughs> You're going to have all week this week. And I was saying to them in the office, I was feeling depressed for having stayed on that long. And I was, you know, I didn't know what to think because I felt useless. I don't know if you felt that way. You know, because I was thinking, we haven't seen each other but been in church for a week and such, another week is coming. How am I going to handle that? Well, in Romans 8, this is a scripture that sometimes we do not understand correctly. Romans 8. Now, there are a few verses there, I'm not I'm just going to mention one or two, where he says that God makes intercession for us according to his will. Do you get that? Not according to what? What you want, how you feel, what your desires are. As a matter of fact, <laughs> do you know that? What Jesus did in his earth life when he healed the sick and raised the dead. I wonder if I should say this. It was a prelude of what he would do to the soul. Because you see, if these people did not accept Jesus Christ, they would die just, just like anyone else and go to hell. Because you see, there's a body to be saved and there's also a soul to be saved. And we put a lot of emphasis on the body and not on the soul. And God wants spirit, soul, and body to be preserved. But most people just rely upon the body. And that is a trick of the adversary. Because remember now, the body you have and I have, God didn't give you that one. Because most of it, most of most people came here all sick and diseased and ready to die. And God's not the God of dead, but the God of the living. That's just a body that God is working with that the, the devil gave you to simulate the body that God has for you in heaven. I don't know if you know that. But notice now, I'm not saying don't take care of it. Because <laughs> that's the only one you have right here. here. And once you're past the slip, you're no good to anyone else. You're gone. But what here you want to do your best in making it to be of service to God. Now, in Romans 8, he says, he talks about, uh, can I just read a few verses here? Uh, listen, I'm going to let you go. Is that okay? I'm trying not to get all hot bothered and wrestled. I'm trying to pawn something out to you. Because I like all that's been said. Good. Thank you. This one sounds worse. <laughs> that one sounds better. Okay. In Romans 8. This one sounds a little better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> in Romans 8. He talks about in verse 25 hope, right? In verse number 26, he says, The Spirit now helps our what? Old man. So, old man. Because your old man needs a lot of help. Because you don't know what you really want and where you're really going, except he's going to help you. He says, he says Help us out infirmities, right? He says, For we what? We don't know what we should pray for, right? Yes. yes, as we ought to, even though we should know. And we can know. Right. At least I know what I should pray for. Maybe you don't. 
He says what we should pray. Did he say for? What we should pray for as we ought. But what? The Spirit Himself. This is not in this is this is not our mediator's no intercession. Make it what? Intercession for our righteousness. For us what? According to what? No, he talks about groaning. And remember when Jesus went to Lazarus? Who? The scripture says what? He groaned in spirit. Why did he groan? He says he groaned because of their unbelief. Why then do the spirit groan today to us? Because of our unbelief. Because we do not know what God wants us to know. Even after he gave you the Holy Spirit. Because we are bent on doing what we want to do. Going where we want to go. Saying what we want to say. Except what God says. And that's why he's groaning. Because we're not getting the results that he has ordained for us to get. We're not saying what he said originally. Remember now, he's going to say something here about predestined, preordained. He's talking about what God has said before the world was, not what was said after. Not what he did not say. Everything that came after that, he didn't say it. But a lot of people are saying those things and not what God said. Like, laying hands on the sick? No. Praying for them, and God says, well, Don't pray for them because what? I already prayed. Yes. He says, You just go ahead and what? Lay hands. Yes. Because you're not doing healing, I, I am. Yes. Yes. He says, When you, in Mark 11, and he talks about, We have anything that which we say. He says, Just believe that you receive. He didn't say, Pray for anything. He just doesn't believe that you receive what he prayed. Yes. Oh, what you said. Oh, yes. Yes. I'm going to have to save this one at the time. I'm going to save this one at the time. But there's so much here that we are missing. Because what? You say what we want to say. Go where we want to go. Do what we want to do, what tradition says, what churchianity says, and not what God says. And what God is working on is a preordained word that he spoke. And that's why Jesus says what? I do not say anything that I haven't heard my father say. He says he didn't take a repetition of himself. What are you saying? He says, I don't, I don't do anything that I didn't see my father did before the world was. What God is trying to make us understand is to get out of this world's orbit That's right. and to get into a new orbit right. where God lives, where the Holy Spirit lives. That's that. Oh, I'm so full of the stuff. This is all good stuff. And I thank God for these elders, for the power of God that's just pulsating through every fiber of their being. And bringing us to higher heights and deeper depths and leading us into the deep things of God. Not so that we may say, I've heard it or I know it, so that we may do it. Yes. This is great. You say, I don't care if people don't approve of me and what I do, it doesn't matter to me. All the people go, the way you're not caring enough, you're not loving enough. What are you know about caring and loving? Nothing. I shared something with the Holy Spirit shared with me about you know, walking in love and walking in peace because it takes someone who does not care about their personal reputation and their personal life to walk in peace. Mm -hmm. Everybody cannot do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everybody
anybody can let them do it. But it is for everybody. Everybody will not do it. Because it demands something of you that you did not de determine you wanted to give up. Because that's too much of your old life. And God has called us into a brand new life. Listen now. He says what? If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. And he says what? Look or behold. All things. All. Everything. Internally, externally, around you. Everything is what? New. You know, just talk about some of the things that we think. He says, your prosperity, your protection, your guidance, mm -hmm. all of that yeah. is new. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And you don't ever have to worry about one single thing you, when you do all things according to God's will. Right. Raise your hand and say, say after me, Father, Father I thank you, I thank you. Because, you. because your will is being done. In me. In me.